Good afternoon and welcome to today's IAC webinar, Low Field Cardiovascular MRI. My name is Kelly Baer and I am the Creative Design Manager with Marketing Communications at IAC. Before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to review a few technical matters and let you know how you can participate in today's session. We would like today's webinar to be interactive, so we encourage you to submit questions. To do so, use the questions tab located on the left side of your screen. Please submit your questions anytime during the webinar as we will monitor questions throughout the presentation and try to answer as many as possible during the Q&A period. Also on the left sidebar, please note the resources tab. Click this tab for a link to today's handout, a PDF copy of these PowerPoint slides. Select the file name to download the handout. Lastly, in the lower left of the player, please note the Request Support button. If you experience any technical problems during this webinar, click this button. A technical expert will be there to assist you with any issues you may have. For those who like to take notes during the presentation, look to the right of the slides and click the Notes tab. There you will see a white text box where you can take notes on today's webinar. These notes will be emailed to you automatically at the end of the session. To be eligible for the ASRT CE credit, you must be registered, logged into this webinar, then complete the survey. The link to the survey will appear on your screen automatically at the conclusion of the live session and also be available from the IAC webinar portal for three business days. If you are viewing this webinar in a group, Please be sure you are also individually registered and logged into this webinar on another computer or device so that we have record of your attendance today. Today's presentation is being recorded and will be posted at a later time for on-demand viewing. This webinar is a joint presentation of IAC and SCMR. And now I would like to introduce today's guest presenter, Dr. Matthew Tong. Dr. Tong is Assistant Professor of Clinical Internal Medicine and Medical Director of Cardiovascular Magnetic Resonance at the Ohio State University Wexner Medical Center in Columbus, Ohio. An active member of SCMR, Dr. Tong is a non-invasive cardiologist specializing in advanced cardiac imaging and treats patients with hypercholesterolemia, structural heart disease, and valvular heart disease. Also joining us today to assist with our live Q&A is special guest, Dr. Orlando Simonetti. Dr. Simonetti is the John W. Wolf Professor in Cardiovascular Research, Professor of Internal Medicine and Radiology, and Director of Advanced Cardiovascular Imaging Research at The Ohio State University. Over his 30-year career, he has focused on the development of CMR pulse sequences and technology to expand the applications of CMR as well as to, as to enable faster and more reliable imaging. And with that said, I will now turn this webinar over to today's speaker, Dr. Matthew Tong. Doctor? Thank you, everybody, and thank you, Kelly, for the kind introduction. And so my name is Matthew Tong, and I'm a cardiologist here at Ohio State, and I'll be speaking on low-field cardiovascular MRI. I have no relevant financial disclosures. However, I will be discussing some off-label uh, scanner and uh, prototype techniques on the Siemens Magnetom FreeMax uh, MRI scanner. Additionally, one uh, caveat disclosure is that I'm an adult cardiologist in cardiovascular imaging, so I'll be focusing primarily on clinical applica applications and less on some of the technical aspects. Here are our objectives for today. We will be speaking about some of the basics of low magnetic field cardiovascular MRI, some pros and cons related to the low field CMR, and recognizing some innovative clinical applications for low field CMR. And to start off, uh, I would like to start off with two cases today, actually. Uh, hopefully these are recognizable cases that uh, we see every day in our practice. This is a 60 year old male with a history of hypertension, hyperlipidemia with dyspnea and syncope. His BMI is 56 with a weight of 393 pounds. He reports some baseline shoulder and back pain where he has difficulty lifting up his arm. And so a transthoracic echo is performed. 
with these images here, as you can appreciate. The top images on the top left are the parasernal long, the four chamber and two chamber views with the non-contrast, and below are our contrasted uh, images uh, provided. Uh, hopefully you can appreciate that this was a technical difficult, technically difficult exam. However, additionally, they were able to appreciate that there was a dilated thoracic aorta on the parasternal long images. And with that, uh, some of concern could be related to a bicuspid aortic valve. Unfortunately, here are the images for the uh, aortic valve on short axis view, and it is difficult to appreciate whether this is trileaflet or not. The second case is a 65 year old gentleman with a history of hypertension, diabetes. HEFPEF, AFib, and flutter with presenting with uh, ventricular tachycardia that was seen on a monitor. A left heart cath was performed that showed no significant coronary artery disease, and he had a BMI of 57.6 and a weight of 409 pounds. Here again are his transthoracic images. Again, on the top left are the parasternal long, four chamber, and followed by the two chamber views without contrast and below with contrast. These images on the contrast look like you're able to appreciate the LV a little bit more, but unfortunately, you really can't uh, appreciate much else regarding any kind of valve structure, the right ventricle, or much of the uh, atria altogether. And so hopefully this uh, is no surprise to anybody with uh, technical difficult exams with the rising obesity epidemic, which has become highly prevalent here in the US of over 40%. And this is regardless of age or sex and is even increasing in Western Europe as well of greater than 20%. With obesity has been well demonstrated, the increased risk of cardiovascular disease uh, whether through metabolic syndromes or increased inflammation. And these patients are even higher, sorry, these risks are even higher in severe obesity. Based on the images that you saw earlier, that the effectiveness of cardiac imaging modalities, particularly in echo and SPECT and CT, have been well demonstrated to have difficult uh, with diagnostic efficacy. And this is seen actually in this Australian study that evaluated 1,100 transthoracic echoes. And in this case, they determine the diagnostic quality, whether it was non-diagnostic versus diagnostic, based on whether they answered the clinical question. And hopefully not too surprising to anybody that with increased BMI, um, particularly in men, that there was a higher risk of non-diagnostic images, up to over 50%, in fact. And not surprisingly as well, there is an increased use of contrast uh, for these patients. And a forest plot over here demonstrates that uh, a higher BMI, particularly over 30, gives you a, at least 60% uh, chance that uh, these studies may potentially be non-diagnostic and not able to answer the clinical question. And so let's step back then to talk about what CMR has been well known for. CMR has been the non-invasive gold standard for structure and function with its high spatial and temporal resolution and uh, not, no limitations as it relates to off-axis viewing. It has also been well demonstrated that CMR has excellent non-invasive tissue characterization, essentially similar to a non-invasive biopsy. And this has been shown in numerous studies, whether it's related to ischemic versus non-ischemic scar, as demonstrated on the left and right um, charts, and also with infarct pattern, and multiple guidelines have been provided, up at least 14 with specific recommendations for CMR. There are approximately 39 class one and 22 class two indications for the use of CMR. However, despite this, there has been low utilization in CMR in the US. The U.S. population represents over 300 million, and there are approximately currently 40 MRI scanners per 1 million people. Based on the U.S. Medicare popula population of approximately 64 million, um, with the CMR scans, there were about 43,000 per year. 
This represents about 678 scans per 1 million Medicare patients. Compare that with just specifically related to stress scans when the, with the, for the evaluation of ischemia, which is a common indication uh, for cardiovascular imaging. You can see here that for stress spec, comparatively, there's about 22, over 22,000 scans per 1 million of Medicare patients. For stress echo, about over 44,000 scans per 1 million, and stress CMR coming in quite dead last at 70 scans per 1 million. And just to put that into perspective, this represents approximately, stress CMR represents approximately 0.3% of SPECT and 1.7% of stress echo. This, is, this disparity is actually worse in rural communities compared to urban uh, communities um, as seen. Uh, unfortunately, some of these barriers that, uh, from a scanner perspective, have been due to either too costly or scans taking too long, or some of these scans are just too complex. And so, the SCMR has spearheaded initiatives to improve access, including this white paper led by Subha Raman, to provide a simplified uh, CMR protocol to address the majority of clinical indications for CMR as seen over here. And then simplifying the core CMR protocol to up to 30 minutes relating to localizers to find the heart, stress perfusion if ischemia is indicated, SINE for cardiac function, and Lake Adelinium enhancement to evaluate for SCAR. And this uh, protocol was implemented globally in low to middle income countries and to, to help improve uh, CMR access. Education was provided to referring and local physicians and experts through CMR um, webinars and conferences to help support pro the program across uh, seven cities and five countries uh, along five years. And what they showed here was that the truncated scanning time demonstrated 98% of all scans were diagnostic quality and showed that it changed care in over 60% of patients with at least one in five patients having a new diagnosis. Additionally, there was a cost saving of at least 30 to 60% related to compared to um, traditional CMR exams. And still over 80% of these centers continue to perform these uh, CMR exams. The important part actually to also highlight is that the cost saving is likely underestimated because the uh, downstream testing reduction was not evaluated in this uh, case. And so other uh, access barriers, even here in the, ICE, the, the US, from a scanner perspective that could limit cardiovascular care in these higher patients, as previously mentioned, especially in the obesity epidemic, are situations like claustrophobia, the inability to fit in the bore safely, and device heating and artifacts. Historically, it was felt that higher magnetic field strength scanners uh, would produce higher quality Im images. This was through higher signal to noise ratio, ratio, which is representative of the currency towards higher resolution. Unfortunately, some of the cons for higher field strength represented higher susceptibility artifacts, higher SAR and subsequently heating, and the increase in costs of manufacturing the device and the infrastructure around the site to um, maintain and <clears throat> the uh, location. And so CMR, low field CMR, had demonstrated some improvements specifically with um, lower cost to manufacture and ma maintenance of the scanner and also lower cost of the site uh, production as well. Similarly with low field CMR, they're uh, safer with less device heating. There's a larger bore uh, to reduce claustrophobia and increase safety of fitting the patients. There's less ECG corruption and lower acoustic noise from the sequence acquisition. One obvious con inherent to low field, of course, is because of the lower magnetic field strength that there was lower signal to noise ratio. However, 
with absent advanced acquisition, reconstruction, and imaging processing methods. This has truly changed and leveled the playing field with respect to SNR. And so there has been previous work done by Benettini's group at the NIH showing that low field CMR works. And here's an example of good old fashioned CMR cine and demonstrating the fact that uh, ventricular uh, volume assessment has excellent correlation as compared to 1.5 T here. Similarly, there's demonstration of LGE uh, for as part of the core exam as previously discussed that uh, in these two patients as compared to 0.55 T as compared to 1.5 T. And so in 2021, Siemens released a commercial low field cardiac, excuse me, low field MRI scanner, the 0.55 T Magnetom Freemax. This represented a lower gradient performance than the higher field CMR with an ultra wide 80 centimeter bore with an optional 700 table weight limit. And there was no quenched pipe. And so because of this, the cost of the scanner was lower and the cost of um, maintenance and the site itself to uh, an infrastructure was lower overall. And so this scanner provided an opportunity to increase access for um, other patients that otherwise may not have been able to obtain these uh, studies. Uh, we here at OSU are one of the first sites to have obtain a free max in an effort to develop CMR sequences. And I'd like to share with you today some of our sequences that we've developed here. To start, as mentioned as part of the core exam, as the commercial 0.55T Cine and Flow on the left are our traditional breath held sequences. Additionally, we have real-time sequences as well, so free breathing sequences that have been uh, reconstructed uh, in our inline gadgetron. And similarly, uh, standard phase contrast flows uh, on the right of the aorta and the MPA. Additionally, we are able to demonstrate late guideline enhancement across the 0.55T. This is an example of two separate patients that had scans performed both at the 1.5T and the 0.55T uh, on uh, section A here, demonstrating the arrows that uh, are able to see LGE on both sites. Similarly, over here in, in section B on the 0.55T and our 3T magnet as well. And these are both uh, MOCO for motion corrected images and our traditional breath held uh, segmented images as well. Additionally, we were able to perform uh, perfusion. On the left here are uh, perfusion images of a porcine model, which had an infarct. And hopefully you can appreciate the perfusion defect uh, located right here. Similarly on the right, we were able to perform a perf perfusion on uh, this patient. So finally, we were able to also demonstrate the applicability of T1 and T2 mapping as part of a quantitative evaluation of uh, tissue characterization. On the top represents the, sorry, the uh, first two columns represent our porcine infarct model, where you can see the pre-contrast native T1 and native T2, representing abnormalities along the septum as compared to the lateral wall. Similarly to the post contrast T1 on the left and the late guideline enhancement that's demonstrated here. Finally, it was uh, at one week and five weeks with the ex vivo images uh, correlating well with histology. And finally, we were able to demonstrate this similarly also on uh, volunteers. Last but not least, we we're able to appreciate perform um, MR angiography, both uh, with and without contrast. This is work uh, from our group uh, as a non-contrast uh, ev evaluation for the thoracic aorta. And hopefully you can appreciate here that along all of the segments of the aorta that the interclass correlation was excellent uh, across the board on both 1.5T and uh, 0.55T.
similarly as we had uh, expected, but uh, now we can truly uh, visualize here is the reduction of device art related artifacts. This is a patient with a prosthetic aortic valve. Uh, when we can compare from the 1.5 T normal field as the low field magnet, and hopefully you can appreciate that there's a lower artifact along the aortic valve on the low field magnet compared to the 1.5 T. This is also similarly appreciated on angiography as well, on the 1.5T and the 0.55T. And hopefully you can also appreciate that the sternal wires are not as significant as well. Uh, so overall less artifact uh, there too. And so finally, let us revisit our previous cases that we had mentioned before. The first case, if you recall, he, uh, had shortness of breath and syncope. And you can see the echo images that I've redisplayed down at the bottom that were previously available. And this is the patient that um, also had the thoracic aortic aneurysm. And hopefully you can appreciate in these images right here that uh, on the top for the low field magnet that you can appreciate uh, all of the chambers of the heart and the valves as well without uh, any use of contrast, actually, in this scenario. And finally, you can appreciate the aortic valve here uh, compared to, from the echo on the left and then the CMR on the right, confirming that this was a tri-leaflet aortic valve. And as part of a one-stop shop, we were able to evaluate his uh, thoracic aorta and 3D reconstruction as demonstrated here. This is a non-gated contrast-enhanced MRA and we were able to measure this, uh, his thoracic aorta uh, in these images as well. The important part to actually highlight in this case is that what would have been his alternative if we didn't have um, this capability? Well, to evaluate his um, aortic valve, possibly he would have needed a TE, which certainly uh, increases his risk um, for sedation. Similarly, if we were to evaluate his thoracic aorta, those, uh, in his case, there would be significantly elevated amount of uh, radiation dosing. And so in this case, we were able to answer all of the clinical questions related to his dyspnea, related to his thoracic aortic aneurysm, and confirm that his aortic valve was trileaflet. Similarly, on the second case here, this is a patient that had non-obstructive coronary disease, but had ventricular tachycardia that was visualized on his monitor. Again, the contrasted images are, excuse me, the uh, contrasted echo images are on the bottom as compared to the CMR, low field CMR images that were performed at the top. Of note, I wanted to highlight that this patient, we actually did try to have him perform a CMR on our 3T magnet with a 70 centimeter bore. And unfortunately, as soon as he uh, entered into the magnet, he, had, he was able to lift his arms and shoulder, but uh, he developed neuropathic symptoms. And unfortunately, his uh, scan was aborted quite quickly and we were not able to continue on the normal field um, magnet. However, we were able to comfortably um, fit him without any issues into the low field magnet. He had overall no complaints from what I've heard from his scan. And we were able to evaluate again, all uh, four chambers of his heart and evaluate his, um, his valvular structure as well. And hopefully uh, some astute MRI readers will appreciate my arrow sign right here, as usually we perform the short axis cine images post contrast. And you can tell that there already is some Lake Adelinium enhancement appreciated there on these uh, post contrast cine images. And this is confirmed on our LGE images right over here on the lateral wall. That was quite prominent that we were able to appreciate. Um, before I forget to mention that in that previous patient's case, there generally would have been no alternatives in his uh, situation, unfortunately, since um, we weren't able to perform a CMR at the uh, regular uh, magnet. And so to conclude, CMR has demonstrated go the gold standard in cardiac structure and function and non-invasive tissue characterization as the non-invasive gold standard. However, there remains barriers in increased utilization. 
And this has been primarily due to concerns of cost, its high complexity and time consumption. However, low field has demonstrated through improved reconstruction and uh, processing techniques that we have the capability of performing the core CMR exam per SCMR recommendations with lower cost to manufacture and maintain the scanner and the, the, the site of construction, which would in turn improve access and cardiovascular care in these high-risk populations, particularly those with severe obesity who already have limited options as hopefully you've uh, come to uh, see uh, in these cases. So finally, to conclude, some future directions as a teaser. Oh, as we mentioned before, that the um, with a lower field magnet, that uh, there is a lower risk of device heating, as seen from previous studies from uh, Campbell Washburn's group at the NIH. That is seen on the left chart here for a uh, temperature probe of a uh, traditional commercial guide wire, showing lower temperature changes on the 0.55 T compared to the 1.5 T. And similarly on the right, showing that these guide wires have significantly less artifact on the 0.55T compared to the 1.5T. And that's, ir that's uh, irrelevant whether um, they're shaped or uh, formed into a loop. And so we've had the priv privilege uh, in collaboration over a nationwide children's and Dr. Amy Armstrong, who is a pediatric uh, uh, interventional cardiologist, to help uh, perform uh, some future of interventional MRI. And this is a case that we were able to participate in with a porcine model where we're able to uh, inflate a, an IVC stent in, um, here, as you can uh, visualize. And with that, I'd like to conclude. I'd like to thank the IAC for the privilege of speaking today. I would also like to thank um, the OSU team, the clinical and research and technologists and nursing staff for the wonderful time of just continuing to work together and uh, bring this innovation to everyone. And with that, I'll end. Thank you. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. And at this time, we will begin the Q&A session. And I'd like to introduce Dr. Orlando Simonetti, who will assist with the Q&A session today. Dr. Simonetti, would you like to start us off? Okay, sure. Yeah, thanks a lot, Matt. It was uh, yeah, a great summary of, kind of where things stand today with low field cardiac MR and um, you know where, where it might take us and what some of the motivation is behind low field uh, imaging where uh, as you mentioned, historically, the uh, things have been moving in the opposite direction, I guess, with MRI in general towards higher magnetic field at three Tesla and seven Tesla and uh, some experimentation even beyond that. So uh, interesting to see what can be done uh, at low field. So, um, yeah, there are a couple of questions coming in from the audience. Um, one is, do you see a significant difference in the scan times? between uh, 1.5 Tesla and 0.55 Tesla? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, certainly the, um, the scanning, the acquisition time to take uh, from compared to 1.5 to 0.55 T is longer. Uh, so it's not meant to suggest that the scan is faster overall, uh, but rather that we're able to provide the core exam uh, of Cine, Perfusion, LGE, and uh, angiography. Right, yeah, so there's, <clears throat> I guess, two um, two pieces to that. One is like the individual scans themselves. Like uh, I know, for example, for the um, breath hold Cine scans that we're running on mm -hmm. the 1.5 Tesla, they take six heartbeats, or sorry, they take three heartbeats, and on the 0.55 Tesla, the low field machine, we've set up those protocols for six heartbeats. Mm -hmm. So there's a longer scan time to, um, you know, help us overcome the signal to noise deficit. But I right. guess in terms of the overall exam time, um, you know, this kind of gets at what you showed where, um, you know, I think we're really aiming more for 
a uh, streamlined, simpler, fast imaging protocol uh, mm -hmm. at, at low field, in which case, um, you know, we can get things done more quickly. Um, yeah, there's a, uh, another question here about stress, uh, stress imaging. Do you use LexiScan for uh, stress testing? Uh, yeah, that's a, a great question. So um, specifically to low field, I think we're not quite there yet. Uh, if I recall, Lon, that the, the perfusion sequence we're, we are, they, they look good certainly for the evaluation of infarct and uh, evaluating that. I think our goal here is to really try to maximize that SNR as much as possible to evaluate for ischemic uh, defects. And um, that's a, more of a stay tuned uh, situation. Certainly, uh, we do um, perfusion, stress perfusion on our 1.5T and uh, soon 3T. And um, there we use uh, adenosine primarily. And uh, the, that's just from our experience overall that we've been using adenosine. Uh, some folks use Lexi at other institutions, which is completely fine, obviously, as well. Uh, we've been using that for many years and that that specifically we've been highlighting that for uh, our quantitative perfusion which is another um, opportunity as well uh, to Im improve stress perfusion overall mm -hmm. yeah the the location of our um, low field scanner here at Ohio State um, is in a new outpatient cardiac MR center we're not set up there yet for uh, any stress imaging just from a staffing standpoint but um, I'm sure when we do get set up, we'll uh, we'll use it there for these uh, this same patient population. That um, right? Yeah, as you pointed out, they really have no alternative. Maybe that's something you could uh, comment on. You showed yes. um, uh -huh. kind of the the deficit for um, echocardiography and how it it struggles in these uh, severely obese patients, but. Um, what about the other imaging modalities? Like, how does this, how does severe obesity impact nuclear imaging, where we could do uh, perfusion imaging, for example, or uh, CT imaging? Yeah, excellent point. So certainly, um, most nuclear readers will appreciate the fact that uh, in obesity, there's a, a very high prevalence of a diaphragmatic artifact, and uh, obviously, our goal is to help reduce the risk of unnecessary casts and um, the degree of radiation that comes not only from nuclear scans, but and then, of course, the inherent uh, part of casts as well. And uh, certainly, we don't, uh, from a CMR perspective, we don't have that, um, that issue uh, when it comes to those uh, diaphragmatic artifacts, because you can appreciate uh, the LV uh, without any uh, limitations, as, as uh, we've seen from some of those previous pictures. From CT perspective, um, that comes with uh, particularly the amount of radiation that it takes to penetrate and, and to, to get to the heart. We certainly would note that we would expect something to be higher to help um, be able to visualize the coronary arteries. So that comes with its fair share of challenges as well. And uh, obviously, from CT standpoint, if we're, this is under the presumption that we're able to rate control these patients. And that, uh, of course, depends more on the clinical status and the clinical status, their ability to breath hold, and the scanner technology, the CT scanner technology as well, whether um, there are specific dose reduction techniques, the uh, slice uh, scanner uh, as well to kind of help uh, improve those. So again, another um, unfortunate limitation uh, in the severe obese population that uh, the MRI is a non-radiating um, test, which can help uh, certainly improve that that access. Mm -hmm. yeah, oh, right. I forgot to mm -hmm. mention right. echo, which I think, uh, sorry for stress echo, I think that uh, inherently is demonstrated from, since we're dependent on uh, wall motion, uh, the hope is that uh, we're able to visualize the, the wall motion, which um, uh, hopefully we've been able to appreciate uh, from some of those uh, images are not necessarily a, an uncommon finding that it's difficult to visualize um, those wall motion abnormalities. Yeah, the um, I guess the primary limitation in these severely obese patients for MRI has been, can they fit safely and comfortably right. in the machine? And mm -hmm. if they do, as you've shown, then um, 
we get effectively the same image quality. There was one question about whether we get enough signal in patients with normal BMI, you know, or compared to those with uh, uh, very high BMI, like you've shown. I guess our experience has been not much difference between the image quality in different um, patient sizes so far. Yeah, right. From a diagnostic standpoint, they have been very similar overall. I believe some of our um, work as it relates to some of the image quality, there may be a potential slight degradation, but it's clear, for example, like in our um, MRAs, MR angios, that uh, it doesn't affect anything as it relates to the um, diagnostic component. So the measurements uh, have not uh, seemed to have affected that uh, actually at all. Right. Yeah, it's, um, I mean, we've had, we've had discussions about this, that it's, you know, it's really about, um, you know, what do we really need to answer mm -hmm. the clinical question to make the diagnosis? Um, you know, are we getting accurate measurements with this low field device? Uh, enough to make the you know make the diagnosis and the evaluation that we need. It it may never have the same image quality as higher field, uh, but can we make the diagnosis, especially in these patients that really have no no alternative? Mm -hmm. One of the other added aspects that it's really hard to study is the sort of the patient comfort level, right? Uh, as compared to some of the other modalities, certainly with uh, echocardiography in uh, this population, it certainly is tough. It's tough for everybody to get uh, adequate images. And um, certainly those exams get prolonged. Everybody becomes frustrated. And we've come to experience, anecdotally at least, that uh, the patients and uh, some of these uh, volunteers have come in and really have appreciated the level of um, ease to going in the scanner, getting the uh, acquisitions and then, wow, we're done, <laughs> kind of scenario. And it really, uh, I think those parts are uh, soft points, right, that are a little bit harder to evaluate to, to help sort of uh, get the, the patient-centered aspect of things, too. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there are a couple of technical questions that have come up that I'll, I, I can go ahead and uh, just answer. One is, yeah, please. Um, <laughs> did the... Uh, uh, do these Freemax results, do these come from uh, research sequences or is this commercially available? And I, no, I mean, you, you made that point and I, you know, we need to stress that, that uh, the cardiac imaging techniques that are, we're working with on the Freemax now, these are all research uh, sequences. We've developed them together with our uh, collaborators and colleagues at Siemens. Uh, but really on an investigational basis at this point. I'm, I'm certain that'll come in the future on the Freemax as like what Dr. Tong has shown, you know, we can do a uh, very good cardiac MR uh, with this uh, system, but currently there is no commercial uh, package available for it uh, to do that. Uh, so that was one of the questions. And then, um, yeah, just comparing the scan parameters for between the two uh, systems, the 0.55T and the 1.5T. And um, there, you know, I, I mean, we mentioned one, like for the CINE, we're scanning six heartbeats instead of three, for example. Um, but really, the, the big difference in scan parameters that we're um, dealing with between the two field strengths is, is not really about the field strength. It's really about the gradient performance that this uh, commercial Freemax system uh, the the gradient speed and amplitude is significantly less than what it is on 1.5T and 3T commercial systems. Uh, and that's where the scan parameters are uh, really more significantly impacted. So, um, you know, we can't collect um, the data as rapidly uh, as we can because the gradient system is slower. So we're... Um, you know, the, the work that we've done over the past year and a half or so uh, on optimizing the scanning strategies and uh, scan parameters has really been more dealing with the gradient performance, I'd say, than it has been the field strength itself. Um, there, um, the details, if you're interested really in those detailed comparison scan parameters, um, there was a paper published uh, just about, I think, about two months ago by 
uh, Julia Varghese from here at Ohio State that Matt and I work with. And uh, it was published in uh, Frontiers of Cardiovascular Imaging. So it's publicly available. And mm -hmm. there it's got detailed comparisons of the scan parameters for the two field strengths. Um, yeah, another question. How long does this basic CMR take from start to finish on the low field scanner? So I would say comparatively, there shouldn't be a whole lot of difference, primarily because a bulk of the time when it comes to performing the scan has less to do with actually the scan itself, but actually all of the preparation, uh, primarily obviously making sure that uh, they're safe to go into the scanner, and um, <clears throat> IV access and all those other um, fun items. Uh, after that, really, um, the scan is kind of what we sort of discussed before, that certainly some acquisitions take a, a little bit longer, and um, some of the sequences may not be uh, as perfectly crisp as with the 1.5T, but um, certainly from a diagnostic component, um, it's similar, and uh, overall, I would say the time is uh, fairly similar, uh, frankly. Uh, we have it set uh, right now that essentially is kind of similar to most institutions that there's a one hour time slot uh, that's available and we've pretty much uh, been able to keep to that uh, that standpoint. Yeah, a couple of questions regarding um, scanning patients with devices. Now we've, um, you know, we've only scanned those with um, passive devices at this point, like mm -hmm stents and um, the artificial valve case that you showed or spinal rod. So the question is, how do you handle scanning patients with devices where those devices have not been cleared specifically uh, for 0.55 Tesla? Yeah, that's a, a great question as well. So certainly, um, inherently, we should presume, we can presume that it should be safer, but certainly there's obvious um, um, legal components that we have to make sure that uh, are appropriately uh, managed. Uh, you had mentioned, yeah, our Freemax is located in uh, an outpatient uh, center. And so because of that, certainly regardless of MR conditional status uh, of the device, there are certain parameters that need to be changed. They're, they're easier on the conditional uh, devices, but um, even then, I think we're still trying to get through that uh, MR safety uh, component. So um, we're getting there too, uh, I would say, just um, definitely another uh, stay tuned aspect uh, uh, component. Mm -hmm. And I think that really ties in nicely to the fact that um, really if presuming, since the GRE sequences that we perform are, are pretty much similar to uh, um, what we see on 1.5T, and I think uh, that, that it will apply those uh, same same uh, applications, primarily, of course, to reduce the artifact, not so much uh, from a heating perspective, I think, um, which uh, I think we're on their way of on on the way for that. Yeah, um, I mean, sir, the these are it's a great question. I mean, it's something we're trying to manage here. The um, you know most of the small passive devices that we're talking about, um, there's really no risk. Uh, there for uh, for heating, you would you would, so anything that we safely scan from a passive device standpoint at 1.5 or three Tesla um, is going to be safe at lower field. The only exception might be is if you get into some exceptionally long uh, lead wires, you know, say abandoned lead wires that mm -hmm. were an exceptionally long length, uh, where that may not be true or it still may not be safe at, at lower field the um yeah getting into active devices that's a different story you know because there we have not only the like pacemakers and implanted defibrillators um because there you have not only the issue of patient safety but you have the issue of the uh the safety of the device like does the mri impact the operation of the device itself and while we don't expect that to be any different at low field than at uh, 1.5 and above, um, that's something that really uh, is going to require testing and I'm sure working together with the uh, those device manufacturers. Mm. 
I know there is work being done at the uh, at Cook Medical. So they're a you know a, um, they manufacture devices, catheters, guide wires, stents, um, and they actually have one of these Freemax scanners at their uh, at their center, and they're um, you know they're actively looking at the uh, the safety of devices in the context of um, MRI guided interventions. And Matt, you you alluded to that a bit. There's work being done at the NIH and also uh, here at Ohio State exploring the use of MRI guide guided interventions. Um, maybe you could touch a little more on that. Like, what would be some of the uh, reasons for that and the key indications uh, that we might want to pursue to go to MRI guidance rather than the conventional fluoro X-ray guidance? Yeah, great question. So certainly um, from an interventional perspective with fluoro versus MR, I think the inherent one is that um, the uh, operator safety actually. So there's essentially you don't have to wear a lead vest anymore. I think that was one of uh, that was one of Dr. Armstrong's um, comments that uh, she really enjoyed doing the procedure without uh, without uh, wearing lead. Uh, so obviously, from an operator safety, that uh, is certainly uh, important, uh, particularly with extended uh, cases. Uh, another component, certainly, in some of the things that we're starting to explore are related to uh, electrophysiology-based procedures. Certainly, are related to contrast use and um, access, uh, essentially. Um, obviously, the iodinated contrast uh, agents, we should be cautious in patients with advanced renal disease. But um, definitely, um, that's where uh, with CMR, we don't have to um, have the, we don't have those limitations as much. Um, we've, uh, in, in some cases, we've uh, used um, ferramoxetol to really improve the uh, SNR in these situations. And that has been a uh, uh, pretty beneficial as well, but um, I think those are prompt, the the main highlights. I believe operator safety, um, the less use of contrast, and certainly being able to visualize where you are in real time, uh, as compared to um, some other cases that might uh, need subsequent uh, imaging, such as uh, uh, operator TE. So now you're exposing two um, providers to uh, increased radiation as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think the other um, benefit we're seeing from MRI guided interventions are the, um, the because we have this soft tissue contrast, um, you know, we have the ability to measure flow so we can actually evaluate the, the impact of the intervention mm -hmm. um, immediately, you know, so we can look at, uh, you know, did we induce uh, you know, did we uh, ablate the tissue where we think we did and uh, to the extent that we wanted to by, um, you know, actually imaging the soft tissue in real time? Or did we, you know, alleviate the um, pressure gradient with our right. stent or valve by measuring the flow there in real time? So, yeah, yeah, a lot right. of real right. potential advantages of taking that approach. Yeah, and I think that's kind of where really... Um, the pediatric population can truly benefit from those uh, components. Right, right. Um, yeah, are you finding any, uh, are you using different amount of contrast agent, uh, different from high field, or seeing any different uh, performance of contrast enhancement? It's funny, we were just talking about this. <laughs> um, yeah, I believe, I don't think we've seen anything uh, related to low field versus um, the normal field. Uh, one of the things that maybe we are um, starting to question is whether um, <clears throat> the TI times might change sooner. Uh, I think that was one of the things that we were evaluating. But um, yeah, we were talking about that primarily because uh, uh, the obese population uh, may need uh, higher contrast loads uh, overall. But um, as far as we've seen so far, I don't believe there's a, um, any difference that we've appreciated so far. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's been, um, that's been our experience, right? That we're using the um, same dose. Uh, we actually use a 0.15 dose. Um, Gadavist. Of Gadavist at yeah. 1.5 T, and that's what we've been using at uh, 3 T and low field as well, the same. Um, 
the the interventional study that you showed there, Matt, that was done in a pig, that I could point out that actually was with paramoxetol and spoiled gradient echo imaging. And there's been some work done uh, by Adrian Campbell Washburn. Uh, she had a paper in radiology a couple of years ago now, I think, on low field cardiac MR. And there she has a table where they looked at the relaxivity of gadolinium agents as well as ferromoxetol at different field strengths and found that um, the ferromoxetol could perform actually even better uh, at low field uh, yeah. than it does at higher field. So that that could be a paradigm uh, going forward where uh, you know maybe greater use of ferromoxetol there at low mm -hmm. field. Yeah, that um, added blood pool agent uh, really kind of adds to that SNR to help us uh, visualize these uh, blood vessels in the heart much better. Right, right. Um, yeah, you, you talked about the <clears throat> the rapid scan MR protocol project from the SCMR and really, um, you know, paring down the MR exam to the basics to uh, facilitate higher throughput of patients. And, and then at the same time, that really reduced the cost of cardiac MR where, um, you know, if we're, if we're spending an hour for a cardiac MR exam on the same scanner that could put three knee exams through in that hour, uh, then, you know, we're really uh, impaired from a cost effectiveness standpoint, just because of the resources it takes to, you know, for that one hour scan. Um, so with, with low field, I guess, you know, we're, we're solving, you know, we're addressing part of that equation where we're potentially dramatically reducing the upfront cost in terms of the purchase of the scanner, the um, maintenance of the scanner, the installation, the you know the the siting, uh, all of that, the costs are are reduced uh, significantly. Um, but at the same time, I guess those you know the 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 question I have is you know is that basic CMR exam, which I guess consists of really CINE, um flow and LGE. Do you feel like that's really sufficient, or are we going to need to uh, implement and incorporate all of those advanced techniques that you know, are becoming more prevalent? The different mapping, T1 mapping, T2, T2 star, pre and post mapping, um, you know, quantitative perfusion, quantitative strain imaging, et cetera. Yeah, so um, we go with the basics, I guess. <laughs> right. I mean, it's it certainly adding a lot of these features which have demonstrated clear value um, throughout all the literature uh, with CMR and it's tough when some of the components of CMR adoption at other sites have uh, demonstrated that uh, this concern of of a myth essentially that this is too expensive too complex uh, too long and uh, certainly what we've come to appreciate from some of these studies, just uh, not only from here um, in nationally and uh, internationally, that we can certainly answer the majority of most standard clinical questions uh, without um, a lot of these um, more advanced techniques. Certainly um, other components such as uh, complex congenital heart disease, um, uh, valve disease that with um, obviously prior um, operate prior operations or replacements uh, things like that um, do start to um, uh, provide some areas uh, where these other techniques uh, can uh, be quite valuable and so one of the examples would be like 40 flow right um, that could uh, really kind of help uh, benefit that and certainly I would imagine that um, with uh, like you had mentioned, ferromoxetol as a blood pool agent, um, <clears throat> contrast agent. I, I can I can see that um, being uh, highly uh, highly impactful in uh, low field. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, yeah, I mean, we want to try to really improve the access as a whole, but at the same time, sort of. Um, provide this level of excellence um, in some of these areas. Uh, how, how do we get to that um, that level uh, of personalization? And uh, 
I think Bowfield has plenty of opportunities to continue to improve, certainly, right, uh, with some of these um, uh, improvements in reconstruction and acquisition techniques. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, one other potential advantage of Lowfield that uh, you didn't mention is in the imaging of the lungs that the yes. that reduce yes. the uh, reduction in susceptibility artifact that comes with lower field enables us to potentially better image the lung parenchyma and even you know looking at functional lung imaging like ventilation and perfusion imaging at MR. So where do you see that a combined uh, cardiac and pulmonary evaluation um, might be relevant? In the patient's wow. future, <laughs> uh, that's a that's a tough one right there. I mean, um, boy, could I suppose one option could be, um, boy, a, a stress uh, cardiopulmonary exam. Um, could we potentially do something like that uh, with an exercise uh, component of it? We already have the real time. Can I just? spitballing now <laughs> um but yeah i mean certainly a cardio a full cardiopulmonary exam just at rest uh, i would imagine provides high value right uh, because uh someone with dyspnea could you uh evaluate not only could there be some ischemic versus non ischemic um burden and then you provide that pulmonary assessment as well that um hey is there some kind of uh ventilation perfusion mismatch that's taken place um that's um yeah certainly a comprehensive exam to kind of help uh, provide someone uh, with shortness of breath right which is a very common symptom uh, particularly in the uh, obese population but um mm -hmm. yeah definitely um the yeah, other focus here was certainly just cardiac but um you know this low field is definitely not limited to to just that uh, that uh, aspect of things. Yeah, I know there's there's some interesting work going on in that direction um, by Adrian Campbell Washburn again at the NIH, and then also uh, in uh, Basel, uh, Switzerland. They also have a, a free max scanner, and they've got a lot of lung imaging experience. And now they're starting to combine that with cardiac MR. So, uh, yeah, I expect to see some interesting things in the future in uh, in that combined cardiopulmonary imaging exam. Mm -hmm. Um, well, I don't, I don't see any more questions coming from the audience, and we're just about at the top of the hour here. Um, maybe I'll hand it back over, uh, unless you had any final comments, Matt. Uh, no, no, thank you so much for uh, coming on this Q&A line. It's sure. been a great talk. Great. Okay. Thanks again, everyone. And a very special thank you to Dr. Tong for this informative presentation and also to Dr. Simonetti for assisting today. Please contact IAC with any questions that were not answered during the Q&A session. To receive continuing education credit for attending this webinar, please complete the survey. The link to the survey will appear on your screen automatically at the conclusion of the live session and also be available from the IAC webinar portal for three business days. On the left side of the My Account page, you'll click on Webinars. Look for the title of this session, Low Field Cardiovascular MRI. Beneath this title, you will click Review Event. On the left, select the Evaluations tab, then click Take Evaluation to complete the survey. Your certificate can then be accessed and printed from the very next screen and any time thereafter through the CE Transcript section on the My Account page. If you have any questions about the survey, please contact us at webinars at intersocietal.org. Once again, we thank you for joining us today and appreciate your participation.